What's up, everyone? Welcome to Level 7. Thank you so much for joining us for another live edition of the Agents of Fandom podcast. I am joined, as always, by my main man, my co-host, my best friend, Garrett Blaney. How you doing, pal? I'm uh, good, scatterbrained, late, but uh, but I'm good. I'm I'm here in my new Thrawn shirt, my new Thrawn sweater, so I'm ready to uh, chat some fucking Andor. Let's get into it. I'm excited, and we had a big, big Marvel News Week. We had a big week of Star Wars, just a big week in fandom in general, and so we had to bring in an expert, somebody who covers it all, one of our favorites from comicbook.com, and his first time on the pod, Charlie Ridgely. How you doing? I, hey, listen, late and scatterbrained is like my base operating level all of the time, so fully on on the same page here That's rocking and rolling like I was, I was telling tj before the thing i got a kid coming in like two weeks so everything is just all over the place and crazy in my life uh so having the nerd stuff to focus on at work has been you know it's nice to just have like a thing to take your attention and that does make sense uh but then you get weeks like this where there's just news every like 30 minutes and it's chaos and you know yeah it's coming it's chaos time. if you will Mm, look at that look at that <laughs> the week has been a coven of chaos and that's going to be one of the first things that we dive into but before that if you're watching on youtube make sure you hit the like button subscribe hit the notification bell all those nice things help us battle those youtube algorithm uh overlords and uh if you're on twitch say what's up in chat grab yourself a sub grab a sub for a friend we thank you for supporting us and if you see one of us muted and eating or off the screen because we have to go to the bathroom guess what it's been a busy day and we're all scatterbrained <laughs> so just mind your business but let's talk about Ag agatha coven of chaos because it has been a hefty news week with that show alone a show that came out and a lot of people are going oh why did they do this we don't need a spin-off of a character like agatha harkness well, let's remember that nobody knew who the hell the Guardians of the Galaxy were. So when a show wins a bunch of Emmys and the uh, song wins a Grammy and it's at the top of the charts, whatever it was, I don't remember what specific award it was. It might not have been a Grammy, but it won a bunch of awards. Guess what? They're probably going to make more of it. And Agatha Coven of Chaos has added Heartstopper's Joe Locke. Uh, I watched Heartstopper with my wife, Ava. She's a huge fan of the show. I've seen it once. She's seen it about five times. Um, and uh, so she was super pumped about this one. And the rumors are going wild that this could potentially be Wiccan, an aged up Billy Maximoff. And that could have just been enough. And then it blew, it blew our minds even more when they added Aubrey Plaza to the cast. Uh, rumored to be a villain, and then even just today they added Ali on and Maria Dizia to the cast. Starting us off with Agatha Coven of Chaos, Charlie, how much did your hype level change this week when it comes to this show? So, I don't know if it changed a lot because I was just, I'm a huge Catherine Hahn fan, so when, like, you're talking about, oh, who needs a spinoff? Like, I'm, I'm, and who needs? That's me. Because uh, it's a whole <laughs> Catherine who, Hahn who show. You? Yeah, it's in what world would you not want an entire show of Catherine Hahn? Like, it's it's even better that it's about witches, but it could have been about anything, and I would have been really stoked because Catherine Hahn is an absolute treasure. Uh, so I was already stoked, and then... I have to imagine you and Jamie are pretty good friends. Yeah, Jamie Jamie Jerick is, is one of the coolest people in the world. So, um, you know, she, <laughs> she has great taste. Um, and so this show was already, like fully on my radar. And it's also like they got the spooky thing with the witches, like not necessarily like Scarlet Witch, but in a more like traditional witch kind of thing. It seemed like that was the vibe we were going to go for with this show. And so I was already really excited about it. And then I don't know, I had not watched Heartstopper, so I don't know a lot about Joe Locke, but Aubrey Plaza being a witch with Catherine Hahn, potentially being the villain of the witchy Marvel show is such great i mean her twitter her twitter handle is evil hag like she this is what she w wants to do she like this is her it seems like an aubrey plaza dream role and when aubrey plaza is doing anything she's fascinating so the idea of her doing something that is so crazy and weird something she wants to do 
is just out of this world. And, you know, there was the rumor really early when the show was announced that there were, like, Hannah Waddingham was going to be a part of it. We still haven't heard any more about that. But one of those early rumored names was Amy Poehler. And so it's like, if this is also a backdoor Parks and Rec reunion, I like, there's no way it's not the coolest thing Marvel's done. So coincides uh, with the Guardians Christmas pre- special as Chris Pratt shows up. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's my hype level couldn't couldn't be higher for this right now. I'm really stoked. I mean, Disney Plus has had varying levels of success with the shows with me, um, but this is the uh, oh yeah, I've got my Agatha over here on the wall. I just, I, I'm not going to get up and get her, but Agatha's hanging out watching over me as we uh, as we talk about it. So um, for those who I'm, uh, I'm really excited about it. For those listening to this in podcast form, I was holding up my uh, Parks and Recreations Funko Pops. And so thank you to those who are listening in podcast form. Or make sure you subscribe anywhere you get your podcast to the Agents of Fandom. Sorry about that, Charlie. The opportunity just came in right at the perfect Oh, no, you're, 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 so you're good. You're good. I <laughs> ramble. So if you cut me off. Like, it's just just jump in, man. I do that. I do that. Garrett was trying to Garrett was trying to make fun of me, but he was muted. So, ha, but ha, I, but, I, but yeah. I caught it immediately. So, props to me there. A little true, true, <laughs> very true. Um, yeah, everything you detailed about Catherine Hahn, that's the way I feel about Aubrey Plaza. And so, I was just so so excited to see this. The first place my brain actually went was, what if, what if she's still just the Shadow King switching over from Legion? And uh, that's the character we're getting. But then obviously more as that report came out is she's going to be potentially playing a witch, something like that. And just give me all the Aubrey Plaza as a witch. What stood out the most from you from this Coven of Chaos news, Garrett? Uh, It's definitely the Aubrey Plaza news. I haven't seen Heartstoppers. I don't really have a connection to any of the other casting announcements. Um, But this, this is the kind of news where like whatever you're doing you stop and you read about it and you find out about it so that was definitely the most exciting thing to me and this is a great time for me to be able to plug our fantastic team who's been able to absolutely crush it on the socials and keeping everybody up to date shout out ryan shout out everybody who's had a hand in that and let me be able to step back and like focus on my personal work stuff but the News like Aubrey Plaza joining a show is like uh, I'm clocking out and I'm clocking into Agents of Fandom and I'm reading what the hell is happening. So my hi- I was already excited for the show. I think more than more than most, not the most excited, but uh, I had a pretty pretty above average hype level, and now it's just through the roof. Um, I I sent this news to my partner Nina as soon as it came out, and then when she came home, we had a nice little freak out session about it. So I think she's very excited. It's going to be a household hit for us. So shout out Coven of Chaos. Yeah. We had really multiple people at, at, the, at Comic Book. A couple of my coworkers were really high on the idea that she's going to be Morgan Le Fay. Um, there, there's obviously there's no confirmation of that. There's no, you know, nothing's been said other than she's probably a villain. But uh, I know Adam and, and Jenna particularly were really high on the Morgan Le Fay idea. And so that would be really, really neat to see. Yeah. Um, I've, seen, but I've heard is, the Morgan Le Fay ideas. It's going to be witchy. I've heard the, heard the Morgan Le Fay ideas. I've also heard Abigail Harkness and her kind of spun to be more evil. I've heard a, gen, a gender bent uh, Nicholas Scratch uh, with uh, and something like that. So it's going to be very She'd interesting. She'd also be a great Mephisto, but that, it seems like that's a part Drew. that's already taken. Oh, God, Drew. Oh, my goodness. That is so <laughs> Sasha's going to be awesome. But I'm okay she, with she Sasha, too. Be really great. <laughs> She'd be a really great Mephisto if that were that on is, the table. Yeah, I know. That is so incredibly true. Aubrey, Aubrey Plaza is amazing. Go watch her in all of the things. Um, but, yeah, shout out to uh, Ryan Cortero, our agent, who has been absolutely just crushing our socials lately. Shout out to Brandon Moore, gifting subs in the Twitch chat like he always does. Just the literal best person that uh, that we know. Um, and he's also got another uh, article popping up to Agents of Fandom shortly on uh, Laura Croft and Tomb Raider. So make sure that you check that one out as well. You know, something to, with this news this week, there was one big connection for me. With Aubrey Plaza getting cast in Agatha Coven of Chaos. Yes, of course, there's the Catherine Hahn, Aubrey Plaza, Parks and Rec connection there. But with Agatha being a product of WandaVision, I don't want to say spinoff even, mm-hmm. 
because I don't know how much it could it'll have to do with it. It could be directly it could literally be a direct sequel and it could literally have absolutely nothing to do with it. And so um, with that, it's just we got Wanda and Elizabeth Olsen and Aubrey Plaza and Lizzie Olsen just have like this weird, amazing relationship like those two love each other. Uh, and ever since uh, they were in um, Angry, Angry Goes West, West. If you Angry Goes West. It, Angry... go see Angry Goes West. Yes, it's exactly. So I just great. watched it again <laughs> last night. It's so awkward and hilarious and great, and has so many great lessons in and, it and as well. Look up their like red carpet stuff, like their at the oh yeah and junkets and things. They're so so good together. Um, it's like we don't know what Lizzie's future is right now in the MCU. Uh, with Wanda, like where things left off, it's just, it's not that oh she may not come. It's we just we, we truly don't know, and it could go any direction. I I think we'll see her again, but uh, the possibility of that is is so outstanding. Uh, and yeah, I hope I hope we get to see them at least interact. Someone with give them. Emma. Some will give Emma, Agent Emma in chat a bonk because she's saying I don't know who Aubrey is playing, but I know she's going to be hot. Uh, so throw, Anna needs to be thrown in uh, horny jail, although I don't disagree with her. But like I was saying, you know, we got this link, Elizabeth Olsen, to kind of all the Marvel news that we got this week. We have the relationship with Aubrey Plaza and this addition to Agatha and the Coven of Chaos. The other news we got is we got Yahya Abdul-Mateen cast as Wonder Man, and then when we thought that was... All we were getting there, of course, with that a, a series of projects getting announced there. Maybe it'll end up being a special presentation. Who knows? Um, and then, of, co- of course, Bob Odenkirk getting now uh, rumored to be added to that cast as well. And then the other piece of news was that Vision Quest is going to be turned into uh, a series starring White Vision as he learns to regain his memories. Maybe a special presentation, whatever, another project. Of course, Wonder Man and Simon Williams, huge ties to Vision in comics. That's how uh, Vision got help created, was the consciousness of Wonder Man. All of these connecting to WandaVision, and it kind of makes me feel like even if Elizabeth Olsen isn't in any of these projects as Wanda Maximoff, she's going to have a very, very big role still overarching in the MCU going forward. Garrett, what do you think of that, and what what of the other news between Wonder Man and Vision Quest really stuck out to you? Yeah, I mean, I would be so shocked if uh, there was no more Elizabeth Olsen and Scarlet Witch going forward. I mean, the stands, just the stands alone, are some of the some of the most vocal, you know, people on the internet. So. It, from many points of view that I think that would just be a poor decision, but yeah, with all this news coming out, it seems, it seems definite that, uh, her and her surroundings are going to be kind of a tent pole going forward. I personally don't know too much about wonder man, but I am a big Yaya fan. And so I think that's fantastic news. I love that. I love that. We're just getting Yaya into the MCU. Um, so happy with that. Bob er- Odenkirk is great. So I think that the news surrounding that show is just fantastic. Whether or not it pertains specifically to me that much, um, maybe not, but I'm still excited. And then Vision Quest, I don't necessarily know if I would want a series. I feel like a special presentation like might be a better format. But who am I to say? Uh, what's up, Shadow? Shadow's looking great. Love a we love a a, a pet. This is actually here. Oz. Oh, this is Oz. What? This is this is actually Oz. So this is Oz. This is uh, Kathleen, Ava's sister, uh, and Liz, her partner. This is their cat, and they're. Uh, I didn't notice the white. In their, in, yeah, in the middle of moving back to Saskatoon, and so Oz is staying with us right now. We are fostering a little dog named Hermes. We got a five animal household right now. Shout out, Cat and Liz. Love and miss them. They're great. Um, I have no idea where I was at, but, uh, oh, I regained my train of thought. I think a special presentation would be like, in my opinion, that's how I would want to view this like vision quest stuff. But I, I'm always blown away by, I'm like never really disappointed by any of the series. So I'm here for all of it and, uh, just, just 
happily here for the news. That's kind of how I felt these past few weeks. Yeah, Yaya Abdul Mahin, huge fan. He was great, and he's been great in literally everything he's been in—the Get Down, Aquaman, whatever uh, you want to book him in. But Charlie, what of that stood out to you? And are you? Do you feel like I do this big overarching Wanda Maximoff vibe to these announcements? I mean, it's been a really great week for hot people in Marvel. Um, with Aubrey, that has already been mentioned on this podcast today, and Yahya Abdul Mateen um, just being one of the best looking dudes on planet Earth. Like, it just, he's also just a phenomenal talent. Um, I, 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 it was criminal how little they used him in Aquaman. I hope he gets a lot more to do in Aquaman too. Uh, he's so good. I, I know Matrix Resurrections was a really contentious movie for some people. I adored it. It was one of my favorites of last year. I adored him in that film. Uh, he's just he's a wonderful, wonderful actor who I just can't get enough of. So him being in this is really neat. And I never would have picked him for for Wonder Man. It just Simon and him didn't. I think part of it is because of the guardians of it all. We've always kind of had, uh, Nathan in that, in that role in our minds. Um, but now that it's there and now you're like, Oh, Wonder Man is, yeah, yeah. It's like, Oh, that makes perfect sense. And I can't believe I didn't think about it before. Um, it was kind of like when someone mentioned the William Jackson Harper, Reed Richards thing. And I'm like, well, I can't unsee it anymore. Like it's too perfect. Here it is. Um, shout out. That's kind of how it felt. Oh, it's it, it, it. Once you see it fit and mm -hmm. that's kind of how it feels with the, yeah, and, there is a lot of Scarlet Witch stuff happening. I don't know if it's necessarily connected directly to Wanda and Scarlet Witch or if it's we're finally exploring. It has its own little corner of, of the MCU, you know, the stuff with Wonder Man, the, potentially the mutant of it all, you know, the, the witches. There's a lot of that happening. Uh, but the Vision Quest thing, what I love is that it continues to give me hope that we could see the Visions on TV or in a movie. Uh, I love, love, love that story. Uh, and, you know, getting Viv Vision in there, I, I would love to see Viv Vision uh, in the MCU, hopefully looking less creepy than Megan from the Megan movie. Uh, but anything Vision related ha gives us the possibility to dive further in that storyline. And there's so much to explore with him and his idea of you know, this concept of trying to figure out what humanity is. He's such a perfect character to, like, answer those questions and explore those ideas and Paul Bettany's really really good at making you kind of ponder as you're watching what he's doing and so more vision is always good to me uh and again the the door being open for the rest of the vision family uh as he's searching for who he is with Wanda potentially gone there's just a lot of room for really interesting stories in there so uh, I, I actually don't know if I agree with you Gary I think I think a whole series to me would, would be a really fun thing to do depending on what they do it could it could go either way but i think there are loads of stories that you can kind of pack into where vision is right now I agree there are loads of stories i just think for me personally i would rather consume it in like a special presentation format mm. but i'm also excited to like as a series that gives me more of an opportunity to kind of delve deeper into that source material that you're talking about so either way oh. i'll be happy little white vision action. <laughs> I love that. Everybody there it is. That. I got that same. Yeah. I got that same uh, Lego pack uh, with the white vision. Oh, there. Brandon Davis so, and I uh, were going yeah. all over town to different Walgreens when those things first started, <laughs> and like calling each other. Hey, I got two visions. It's like, well, I got an extra Scarlet Witch, and you know, trying to find this whole, this whole collection. It was a, uh, it was a fun couple of weeks trying to track all these down. When they first yeah, came I got, I got all of them too. It's a fun little, it's a fun little group. Uh, good you mentioned Viv Vision because Damon was going crazy for that in uh, in uh, chat. But, you know, we got a little bit of other news I want to run through real quick, and then we're going to start talking some Andor. We're not going to spend a lot of time on the rest of the news because we can't have another hour and a half long show. Charlie's at work at comicbook.com right now. Garrett's uh, literally just walked in the door as we started recording, and I got an NBA show after this, so... 
We got stuff to do, people to go, places to see. We're going to give you the uh, news roundup nice and quick here. EA has, is uh, reportedly developing three Marvel action-adventure games for console and PC. We are hella excited about that. And uh, we put a, posted a poll over at the Agents of Fandom Twitter. You can find that at twitter.com slash Agents Fandom. And... Uh, daredevil was the was the winner people want to see a daredevil game uh, come out of this that was the leading uh candidate we also got sandman 2 or sorry sandman reportedly uh being renewed for a season two by netflix this is great for sandman fans we talked to the composer of the score from sandman david buckley you can find that up on agentsoffandom.com as well as our youtube page the Acolyte, Star Wars The Acolyte, just added Daphne Keene to the cast. And uh, many may know Daphne as uh, X-23, Laura Kinney from, uh, from Logan, which we talk about a lot on the podcast. A great, great uh, movie. And so we're excited to see her entering the Star Wars universe. And Andor, Andor Season 2 uh, has found its directors. They've been revealed by uh, creator Tony Gilroy. That was an exclusive to Collider. And so you can find that up written by our friend by um, our friend Maggie Lovett up on collider.com to take a look at that one as well. I talked to Robin De Jesus of Tick Tick Boom today. We had a real great quick conversation. I'm such a big fan of his and Tick Tick Boom and uh, a little exclusive clip from the interview. That's not going to drop for a while due to uh, Welcome to Chippendales embargo, but we did discuss, he's been doing a lot of work, of course, with Andrew Garfield, now with Kumail Nanjani, and Welcome to Chippendales is also directed by Matt Shackman. So we talked a little MCU, we talked a little Fantastic Four, and he gave us some insight into who he'd like to play in the MCU, because he's a big fan and he wants to take on a villain role. So keep your eyes peeled to the Agents of Fandom YouTube, and uh, as well as agentsoffandom.com for that. Also going to be chatting with uh, some of the creators from the Mickey Mouse documentary uh, coming soon to Disney+. Plus. Strange World press conference with Jake Gyllenhaal and uh, Gabrielle Union, as well as the Disenchanted press conference with Amy Adams. So make sure you keep your eyes peeled to agentsfandom.com for all of that. <gasps> Let's talk some Andor. Charlie, what have you thought of the series as a hold so far? And episode 9. What are you thinking? You got that Andor poster right beside you. Oh, man. yeah, I know no, it's, it's been behind me for, for weeks now. Um, I put it up, like, in the hopes that I think this is going to be my favorite Star Wars show, and I had this poster. I, you know, I've got this frame that my lovely wife got me for Christmas a couple years ago, one of the front loaders that I can, you know, swap in and out, and um, it, it is it has exceeded my even high expectations. I don't want to be hyperbolic, uh, but in my opinion, at least through nine episodes... This is the best thing that Disney Plus has done since it launched. Um, I mean, I've enjoyed the Marvel stuff. I've enjoyed, you know, obviously I love Mandalorian and uh, Book of Boba Fett and all the, the, the stuff Star Wars has done. But Andor is just far and away for, from a technical level, from uh, from a writing perspective, just an incredible piece of television. It's, it's one of the best shows on TV right now anywhere. And for me to say that about a Star Wars show on Disney Plus feels very crazy. Um, but but it is. Every episode, I just... I feel more... I feel stronger that, like, that's... that that's where I'm at with this. Yeah, the... I believe it was the sixth episode, kind of the culmination of... Um, of the heist arc. Where they, they, they pull off the heist under, like, the... The, the eye. View, or, or the eye. Oh, my lord. It was a gorgeous looking episode. It was so perfectly written. The character twists were incredible. Um, just every moment of that, of that episode like had me on the edge of my seat, and that's something that I have not felt, you know, for a, a couple of years in Star Trek, you know, Star Wars at least, and you know, back since the first couple movies of the of the new franchise of the, the Disney version of the franchise came out, and uh, it's just it's been very refreshing despite being so dark and so intense. Uh, it, it's really kind of lifted my spirits because it is, as much as I like the other Star Wars shows, I have gotten that kind of sense of like, all right, we're really milking nostalgia here and we're really telling stories with the purpose of setting up other stories and we're telling stories with the purpose of finding big moments to introduce a character that everyone loves. You know, I did not love all the Luke Skywalker CG bringing him back weirdness. 
And I was like, this isn't fully what I wanted from Star Wars TV. And then now Andor's come along. And it's like, oh, this is this is it. This is the thing that I had wanted so you know for so long. This is the kind of story I've just I've needed from Star Wars. Uh, and it's just it blows me away every week. And Episode Nine, I know we'll dive much harder into it uh, here in a minute. But Episode Nine was another great entry to what I got going on. Andy Circus is so damn good. Uh, I'm I'm so glad that they were, that they brought him back. And it wasn't one of those like oh well you were technically Snoke so like you couldn't see him doesn't matter here he is and the every moment he has especially that last line that you know never more than twelve that delivery just got you to leap out of the couch and like want to fight something and then the episode's over and it's like I have to sit with all this energy until next week when I can channel it into something. Uh, and, and that's what you want from a TV show. I love weekly TV. I love, you know, the idea of having to wait and tell a story over time. Uh, and this episode, this, this show and specifically this episode does such a great job of setting that up and making you really want to come back a lot. Like, you know, House of the Dragon obviously did a great job with that. Um, and or really kind of hits those same beats of, of just the necessity to keep watching. Uh, it's something I have not gotten bored with at any point, And that's, that's a real feat now when everything it feels like it's been done on television at some point to have something feel so different and so new. Um, weirdly by going back, like they're not breaking any ground by telling the stories they're telling. There's, they're simplifying things. You know, Tony Gilroy has really stripped away a lot of the excess and focused on a couple of real, you know, humans in this universe and their struggles and their fears. You know, there was a great thing on Twitter about how this episode, there was no big fight. There was no action. There was no CGI. It was just some characters that really feared for their lives trying to figure something out. And it was so intense. It was more. It was as intense as any any fight, any lightsaber duel, any war that we've seen. And it was just people in their in their voices. And I just, oh man, I, I love I love that kind of writing. As a writer, that's the stuff that just it fires me up so much. Uh, and I just I've had that feeling every week with the show. So I'm. Again, I don't want to be hyperbolic about stuff, but I can't help it with this. I'm just, I'm over the moon about how Andor has turned out. I don't even think you're being hyperbolic because like, now I'm, I am a sucker for the nostalgia stuff. I love the Luke Skywalker. I love We all, we all like Oka. it to a degree. We all have stuff that yeah. we attach to, you know? And so like, yeah, I like, I, in terms of pure enjoyment, I love that stuff. And Andor hasn't been my favorite series of all the Disney Plus things that we got, but I feel pretty confident and saying, like, undoubtedly, I think this is the highest quality series Marvel, Star Wars, we have received on Disney Plus so far. Like, I think it is the best. It is the most worthy of awards. It hasn't, like, tugged at my heartstrings and clicked in certain ways that of just the things I love mm -hmm. the way other things have. But in terms of the thematic quality, the shots we get, the writing, um, the just hard take on ground level empire rebellion and fascism it's been incredible it's truly been incredible writing and the line delivery from andy circus of never more than 12 at the end of this episode just sent shivers down my spine now i saw episode 10 of andor is actually already up on disney debut and i've watched it and it was incredible and i'm not going to um I did not know that i'm never and i'm not so i'm not you're not going to get the normal theory TJ out of me that you usually get because I don't want to spoil anything. So Garrett, I'm going to throw this to you. What are you laughing so hard at and what did you think about the ninth episode? I was a big fan of, uh, of this episode. I mean, Charlie, to make you feel better about feeling hyperbolic, I was someone who was like not stoked about this show coming out because like Damon is continually bringing up in the chat, I don't really connect to Cassian Andor um, personally, or I didn't through Rogue One. So I, when his show was announced, I was like, oh, okay, I guess whatever. But as the weeks go on, I can agree with you on pretty much everything you've said. Uh, it's becoming one of my favorite Star Wars shows. The Even without big epic action scenes, the way the tension is built... Um, seeing the inner workings of these things that we've known about for so long but have never seen the 
that them get their hands dirty essentially i just think there's so much about this show that uh it, it's 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 phenomenal and i was not expecting for it to be that way for me which makes it that much more satisfying and seeing this episode with andy circus it's just more of the same. I, I was sucked into the entire time. I feel like, and I, and I still don't even necessarily love Cassie and Andor as a, like, I, I understand him more and the shades of gray and, yeah. and who he is as a character, but that's not even my favorite part of the series. Well, like, and, and they don't, they don't try to force you to like him. I mean, a lot of us like him because of Rogue One, because we've seen him there and I like watching his character evolve, but he is not a likable person. No. When the show starts, and you could argue there are very few people in the show who are just outright, the characters are outright likable. I mean, I love the performances. Uh, uh, Enoch, um, I can't remember his name, but he was one of the rebels, the guy, he was in The, the, the Bear. Ah, um, uh, yes, yes. And, I, I'm not going to, I don't know his name oh, either. Oh, man. He, he's incredible. Like, you, you don't like his character, but it was such an energetic, like, charismatic performance. It was like, I loved every second he was on TV. Um, and it's just, they, they found ways to make these people very real because there is no just like, well, they're a straight up hero and you like everything they do. Like, no, they're complicated. You know, they're, they're all very complicated. Yeah. And they it, realize they have to really operate in this moral gray area to, to get out of the under from the boot of this oppression. So like they are willing to give up their humanity for like the greater good of the freedom of the galaxy. So it's so compelling to me. But even, you know, like in, in, in the original trilogy, when you have these people who are sacrificing everything for the rebellion, you know, like that's that's kind of what you get is people that are, are ready to do everything. You have, you, have, you have Han that is kind of in the middle, but all the people you meet from the rebellion are just all the way in and because that's where it grows. But this idea of like only a couple people are all the way in. Everyone else has reservations. Everyone else has fears that they don't know if they're all the way in or not. They're just, they feel like they need to, but then they also have their own selfish things that they need to accomplish and hey if this doesn't work do i have a thing to fall back on am i gonna die how much does my own life matter to me is com is over committing to this a thing can can you be too far into it you know there's the debate yeah. that kind of revolves around Saul Guerrero. like can you be too far gone into this idea that is a good idea it's just there's so many layers to to humanity in this and and i love i i think you mentioned like the, these tiny moments that exist in the whole idea of the prison, like when you when you've watched Star Wars forever, it's like, what? How are the droids built? How was the Death Star put together? Like you think about how like the logistics of those things, and I guess you kind of assume like, well, all this technology they have, there's this droid factory, and they're just it's just you know running on its own. You never think of like the very real concept of like they slave enslaved labor. people. Yeah, they you know they threw people in jail on fake charges that and that they're never going to actually let out as we learn and these people are the ones making all the weapons and all the vehicles and all the stuff that we see in the movies and and it just it adds so much weight to the whole world that we've the whole galaxy that we've existed in for you know for decades that we've fallen in love with it's just it it adds to the legacy of everything star wars which I don't know how many shows or movies in Star Wars have really done that where it you can look and you can see it affecting the way you watch every single other Star Wars thing that there is. Uh, it's, it's, it's really powerful stuff. The only thing I can, the only other project I can say that for, for me, is Star Wars Rebels. That has affected especially my now. viewing. Especially of, now. Especially, as especially like, now. Yes. You know, leading the charge of, of, the, of all the TV universe. Uh, and I said about Andor, it's like all these other TV shows. As I, I enjoy them, I love, uh, I love what Favreau and Maloney are doing, or Filoni. I, I said that there was another uh, Christian Maloney was cast in the Penguin, and so I'm just, I'm still so much that, news. But, uh, <laughs> you know what what Favreau and Filoni are doing is so so cool, but I love that here's this show that is just in no way, shape, or form connected to any of those other things that are being built. You know, the Ahsoka show, the Mandalorian. Boba Fett, all these are kind of intertwined, and then there's Andor, completely on its own. Uh, and it has found a way to, like, stick with you for days after you watch it. Um, despite not nice. giving you, like, the Easter eggy stuff that you want to necessarily talk about about these other shows, it, it, it makes you think about it, and that's 
to do that in a Star Wars thing is, you know, I think that's what George set out to do a long time ago. Um, and this is really kind of accomplishing that. And it, the realness is so incredible and it's so counter, like so opposite of what we've seen from some portions of Star Wars of like, there is light, there is dark. This is how we do it. This is how you don't do it. We see in Andor all of the shades of gray, the extreme, the extremity of Saw Gerrera, the extremity of the Empire on two different sides. We see different people in the middle, and we see people like uh, Luthen, who maybe gets a little on the side of Saw Gerrera sometimes, tries to maintain some sort of moral compass, and you know. What I love about this show is we're seeing kind of a trope that I don't mind with Andor, and that's the the reluctant protagonist. The reluctant protagonist. My least favorite um, trope is the protagonist who loses all their powers and abilities and is just nerfed for the entire movie or show. I hate that. That's why I don't like Thor, the first Thor movie. That's why Iron Man 3 took me so long to, to come around to. Um, but in Andor, they give us the reluctant hero, somebody who doesn't, who just wants to live their life, who just wants to do what's best for them and their family and isn't really worried about all of this other stuff. And if we're being honest, that is probably the most real type of hero if any of this stuff would exist in real life. It's not the villains. It's not the he It's not the Captain Americas. It's the people that want to live their damn lives until they are pushed to the very edge and are forced to rebel. And we hear Luthen talking about, yeah, we need to make these conditions worse for the people because they need to want to rebel. And when you hear him say that, it sounds so harsh. It sounds so terrible. But then you see the example of Andor. He doesn't want to do any of this stuff. And when he steps up, he's very capable. And so it's, it's kind of very incredible to see the realness of that. And also the aspects of their, that they're showing outside of this with just the Empire and in general that I didn't even notice until um, that are just hitting with like all different types of people because there was a scene that I saw it on Twitter today and it didn't even pop into my head really at all. And I realized at that moment when I saw this on Twitter how much of that was just specifically because of my privilege because this isn't something that I have to worry about. But it's the scene between Dedra and and uh, Mama's boy who got fired. I can't remember mm. his name. Karn. And yeah, and he is just saying like, no, like I, I always come by here to see if you're gonna stop by. Like I needed to talk to you. I need to do this. And he she shuts him down. And she shuts Fucking him down. And she shuts him down. <laughs> and he at the end of it, he's smiling of like that was a good interaction. And to me, I just kind of viewed that as like, oh, gross. And then that was it. But for a lot of women, that's a very common lived experience of a dude being creepy and not getting taking no for an answer and it leading into stalking or worse things. And that was a very hard hitting real moment from what shitty people do in real life and what shitty people do in in the galaxy far, far away as well. And there are so many different aspects of that with just within the jail, like within the jail, within the empire and within the everyday life of this show that are just so hard hitting. Yeah, she what what registered that to me like immediately was he says, you know, something about our conversation the other day. And she's like, conversation. I literally had you like arrested and taken in for questioning like in what world is that just a conversation? So that shows to me, like, just how far gone this guy is. And, uh, yeah, that scene, I'm glad you brought that up, TJ, because that stuck out to me on watch. And now thinking back and, like, talking about it, I completely forgot about that. So I'm so glad you brought that up because that's not ever, that's not something you, like, have ever seen in Star Wars or would ever really think to see in Star Wars. But I'm so glad that it's, because what this show has shown us is like these are similar people to us right obviously it's different in that they can travel the galaxy and have lightsabers and shoot lasers but you know at the heart of it they're people like us and uh that was a heartbreaking interaction absolutely carlos yeah, especially it kinda, it kinda, with, i'm uh, sorry go ahead 
I just want to say quick, Carlos in chat nailed it with Luthen is the prime example of Sam Wilson's line in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. He's out of line, but he's right. And when you see Andor with his back kind of against the wall and becoming a little more resilient and a little, little more willing to rebel as he is oppressed and thrown in jail and just really losing all of his comfort you see that willingness to rebel and Luthen, he, he, he's out of line but he's right sorry charlie you go and, and, and what i love it's just to, to jump to that it, is there there you know it represents different you, you talk about all the different shades of gray yeah there are a lot of people are like yeah Luthen's right there are also a lot of people that are that sit and watch and say saw guerrero is right and Luthen needs to listen you know like there are there are so many different levels to find and characters to relate to especially kind of in our really heightened political time to have someone like Saul be like, no, there is no acceptable version of this and we have to burn it all down and start over. You know, you're going to have people agreeing with Saul, you're going to have people agreeing with Luthen, you're going to have people agreeing with Andor. Um, and what I love about this, the prison scene, which I thought the prison story would, would end with this because the, the first six episodes operated as, you know, pods. It was almost like kind of a feature film. Here are three episodes and it kind of moves on to this next like chapter of the story and then you have three episodes you know, telling you know the heist at Aldani and then now we're gonna have three episodes with the prison thing but that has not been resolved yet and so I'm really excited to see where it goes but I love there's two things that it does here one is that it continues to paint the picture of Andor that it wants to not the one that I think people want to be painted Andor is still acting fully of his own accord he's still only acting in self-preservation he is not trying to start a riot because he wants to overthrow the Empire. He wants to get out of prison and survive. He wants to be free. That's the only thing he wants to do. Now, we can watch, kind of removed from it, watching you knowing Star Wars and say, well, the way you get that is taking down the Empire. You know, you're still, you know. And I think it's something he's going to learn. But right now in the show, through Episode Nine, he doesn't care about that right now. He is just trying to get out. The person that is really following kind of the, the roadmap that Luthen laid out to Andor is Andy Serkis. You're seeing this guy, he just wants to follow the rules. He wants to get out just like Andor does, but he knows he's close to it. He's trying to follow the rules, do his work, not get zapped by the floor, and go home. He wants to go home. When he realizes he can't go home, and he realizes the oppressive state of, of who's really in control, it becomes this, this rallying moment for him where he says, okay, we, we are in a place that is wrong, and he's finally pushed to the brink. Part of it is self-preservation, but part of it is just this release of frustration of like I've given them what they've asked and they're never going to really change who they are this is a problem and so while Andor is still acting selfishly you can watch this other character dive into this you know dive into this rebellion to a, to a degree I'm sure he doesn't know what's really going on in the rebellion but he's going to rebel in the, in the way that he can and that's something we've seen of Andor that, you know you talk about the reluctant hero he, he inspires people reluctantly or even on accident you know he's not trying to inspire a rebellion but that's what he's doing every place he goes you know it happened with his adopted mom because he was the one at aldani because he was he had to be there based on his circumstance you know bix and now you have andy circus like everyone that kind of comes in contact with him is being inspired and he just doesn't realize it yet he doesn't realize that he actually makes people care about things and I love that we already know we're going to get a season two of this and 24 total episodes because I'm not begging for that reveal yet of, of Andor. There's going to be a moment in the show. It's going to be a lot of little moments. There's going to be one big moment where it clicks with Andor for the first time. And he makes a decision to fully go into this rebellion. I... And it hasn't happened yet and I'm, I'm excited for it and I'm not stressed about it because I know we already have so much show to go that it's okay to not happen yet. I just get to enjoy where he's at. He's going to read the manifesto. That's that moment. We have to get, uh, we got a hard deadline to be out of here in nine minutes. So I'm going to speed us up and just say so many things that Charlie talked about. So many things that are being talked about in chat. I want to feel like I want to give a response to, but I just am very excited for everyone to watch episode 10 and very excited for us to talk about episode 10. And I think kind of the culmination of what you were saying there, Charlie, what it made me think of was a lot of with great power comes great responsibility vibes coming. 
-hmm. and we are seeing even in reluctance how capable Andor is to inspire to lead and to rebel just straight up get the job done um but before we get out of here before we do our closes a big reveal this episode that we didn't really talk about mon mothma's cousin was mm -hmm. the lieutenant from the rebellion working directly with luthan Charlie, tell me what you think about all of this tying together. Garrett, I'll get your final thoughts, and then I'll take us out. I, I mean, so far it doesn't really, like, I don't know what it means yet. I just love how Vel is is deeper into the story than we think, and I was kind of worried she would kind of not be a part of it after episode six. Um, so I'm really glad that's not the case. I'm really glad she's she's got a bigger role. Um, but I think more than for Vel, I think she's, she's committed. I think it does a lot for Mon Mothma, and I think it, it gives her a state, you know, she is putting herself and her career on the line, but something that we've noticed from her is she is not willing, doesn't seem willing to sacrifice others. She's fully willing to, to let bad things happen to herself and to put her career and her well-being on the line. But she was, she, you know, when she talked with Lothan, it, when she did not want anyone to be hurt. And he's like, well, that's, that's part of the, you know, that's part of why I play this game is it's going to happen she's not willing to put other people's lives on the line. And now we know that she not only doesn't want that, she has someone who she truly loves putting themselves front and center on the line. And it, it adds another layer of, you know, of, of sense to her reluctance. It adds to her frustrations with the rebellion and her reservations with the rebellion. And it just, there's so much more to Mon Mothma than, than we know. And I think we're going to keep peeling layers back. You know, there's still so much mystery with her, her daughter and then her, her friend from childhood and her terrible, awful husband who I cannot wait to see meet a miserable death. There is just, there are so many Tim. facets to her. Um, but I'm, I like that they're peeling back a little bit. I'm, I'm excited to see. I, I do think it means that Vel is going to, bad things are coming for Vel uh, because we know Mon Mothman needs to continue evolving because we know that she's involved later. Um, but I'm, I, I I like how they how they kind of tie some of that together. I think it it adds a lot to those characters. Hundred uh, percent. I think uh, I'm I'm on the same page as you. I think bad stuff is coming for for her husband, her daughter, uh, and Val. And while everything you said was super great, super nuanced, I'm gonna take it one step backwards and say that uh, Charlie, you don't know this, but. Every week on the episode that we've talked about Andor, I have to make a comment about how fire the outfits are, especially in the Coruscant scenes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Vel was just giving uh, space influencer vibes, and I was super here for it. I love Vel as a character. So Whoever does Vel's hair on this show should be given several awards. Um, because the first time when she showed up in Coruscant, like, just... Different person. Outstanding. Yeah. Outstanding. Oh, I'm, I'm the, the, the fits, the entire costume design and like makeup design and I, hair and makeup has been phenomenal. I've, I say it all the time. Um, I, I will eat the L that she is not Luthen's daughter, but uh, I actually, I, I'm going to say that I enjoy her being Mon Mothma's cousin even more than that. So, um, I, and, and, oh, that, and that makes, her relationship with Cinta like that much more poignant um and we know Cinta's history with with um with the empire too so i loved the callback of Cinta being like no we're rebellion first and then we come after and then in this episode Vel says to my mothma rebellion first and then everything else for us comes after so i'm i'm digging every aspect of the show uh, Charlie, when you began talking, saying you were being hyperbolic, I don't think you were at all. I, I think the show it's, deserves it's a special show, man. It is it's a special, a special show. show in every way. And I think that we've been blessed with some fantastic TV this year throughout the entire year. So the bar is already really high. And I think it's, mm -hmm. it's up there at the top of the list for me. You guys are making this hard as hell for me to hit Charlie's deadline and get him out of here on time, yeah, but it's because we're it's, having it's great hard, conversation. Hard to, Talking's fun. Exactly. You know? We're having great conversations. Rambling's, say, rambling's fun. Charlie, I need you to DM me right after you watch episode 10 so we can uh, we can chat about it. 
go watch Andor. Go watch Tales of the Jedi on Disney+. Plus. Uh, it's fantastic. You can catch my review up on agentsoffandom.com. Sub on uh, Twitch. Make sure you're following us. Like and subscribe on YouTube. All of the, wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a five-star rate, rating, review, all those nice things. Charlie, thank you so much for joining us today. This has uh, been a blast and definitely can't wait to do it again sometime soon. Absolutely, absolutely. Sorry, you know, I had a little, you know, only had a little window today, but it was, uh, it, was, it was a good time. It was good catching up with you guys. That's no problem at all. Before we let you go, tell the people where they can find you on socials. And I know you've been doing lots of House of the Dragon content, stuff like that. Just tell the people the yeah. kind of work you do and then uh, we'll get out of here. Yeah, no, and just, you know, gen- we're covering everything at comicbook.com. We got all kinds of, we got, you know, Stokes and all the fires over there. Uh, and like, so we had a lot of great House of the Dragon stuff kind of coming. We're still, you know, getting some things going. It's kind of, we wrap up thinking about that first season. Um, but you know, with Black Panther coming out, I know we've got a lot of great stuff planned uh, for Black Panther and some good stuff for the end of the year. Uh, like I said, I'll, I'll be kind of stepping away from a lot of it for a couple of months with, with the baby getting here. Uh, but I'm really excited to kind of just be on the outside for a minute and, and read all the great stuff my, my, my co-workers got going on, um, you know, everyone I work with is just so good at what they do. And so it's, it's really, it's really neat to just kind of take in, take in what they're doing uh, right now. Special shout out. One of my coworkers, my, my really good buddies, uh, Adam Barnard, he just got married. Um, but he, uh, he's got some, some great comic stuff he's been working on. He and I work on, you know, talk about comics all the time and he's got some original stuff that he's doing on a Kickstarter. And so, uh, you know, follow Adam on Twitter and, and look at some of the stuff he's got going on, you know, writing new original fun comic universe stuff. Uh, and, you know, again, comicbook.com, we're going to have uh, anything that you like out there that's remotely nerd-oriented, it, we've we've got it going on. So there's And a, look, you don't have to just follow Adam on, on, you don't have to just follow Adam on socials. You can head to the Agents of Fandom YouTube page and uh, check out our uh, our friend Damon, uh, Damon Gray. I always want to call him Damon Tweet or Damon Streams. Uh, Damon Gray his interview with Adam Barnhart talking about all those indie comics he does and where you can find them and what got him into comics is up on the Agents of Fandom YouTube page. So make sure you check that out. Follow Charlie on uh, socials as well. And thank you so much to everybody who joined us today. It has been an absolute blast and we will see you next week. Peace. Peace.